So we are going to get started. Uh, welcome, welcome to our Constitution Day uh, event and happy Constitution Day. Um, I'm Jason Mazzoni. I'm a professor here at the University of Illinois College of Law. So uh, I'm just going to say a few words by way of introduction. What is Constitution Day? Well, Congress designates a day on which every year educational institutions like this one uh, that receive federal funding are required to hold uh, events or an event uh, commemorating the Constitution. And the day that Congress picked is September 17th. Uh, this year, that is tomorrow. Saturday, so Congress in its wisdom says that uh, we don't think anyone's going to show up on a Saturday, uh, so you can do it on a Friday uh, if it falls uh, on, uh, on, on on a weekend, and so here we are. But why September 17th? That's the date in 1787 when the delegates to the Philadelphia uh, Convention, a majority of them, 39 out of 55, sign uh, the document that they've drafted. Um, so it's the end of the summer, right? it's been debated uh, and uh, modified, and now we sign our names. Now, if it were me, I don't know that I would have picked uh, September uh, 17th for Constitution Day. On September 17th, 1787, the Constitution is just a draft uh, that has emerged from a secretive convention. It's not, of course, law yet. Before anything further can happen, Congress has to send the draft document to the states for them to consider. That happens on September 28th, so maybe you could have picked that day. But maybe that's also the wrong date because it's still just a proposal until it's ratified. Delaware is the first state that does that on December 7th, so maybe you can go with uh, that, but that's only one state. You need nine for it to take effect among those nine states, and you get that um, when New Hampshire says yes on um, June 21, 1788. Of course, that's in the middle of summer. You're not here either. Um, if you care about all 13 states ratifying, uh, so the Constitution applies across the entire country, that happens when Rhode Island signs on finally on May 29, 1790. Now, of course, if you start down this path, there are various uh, kinds of possibilities and options for picking a date for Constitution Day, because as you know, even after the Constitution is uh, ratified uh, and takes effect, there's a long and continuing and often difficult process of putting it into place and figuring out what it, uh, what it all means. Today's speaker has been at the forefront of helping us figure out what the Constitution that emerged uh, in draft form from the Philadelphia Convention on September 17, 17 1787 means. We are uh, really honored uh, to be joined today by uh, John Whitty Jr., who joins us from Emory, where he's the Woodruff uh, professor of Law, uh, Emory's highest honor, I believe, uh, and uh, the McDonald Distinguished Professor of Law, uh, and the director uh, of the a really extraordinary center for the study of law and religion at Emory. Uh, his topic today is Why No Polygamy? Please join me in welcoming Professor Whitty. Well, thank you so much uh, for your warm and generous introduction. Good afternoon to each of you. I appreciate your being here on a rainy afternoon and having a chance to be together. I know, no doubt, uh, many of you under conscription orders. Um, it's good to be back here at Illinois. Good to have a chance to interact with the wonderful colleagues and faculty and students here. Had a wonderful conversation just an hour ago uh, about the fundamental questions of marriage and family. And it was led by my distinguished colleague and friend, Professor Robin Wilson. And I want to say a word of admiration and appreciation to her uh, for her visionary work in the field of faith, freedom, and family, trying to uh, mine the, the deep uh, sources of this in the tradition, trying to demonstrate to us uh, how family law needs to be reimagined in the 21st century, consistent with that tradition, but especially trying to harmonize and find means for harmonization uh, of the fundamental claims of religious freedom and sexual and same-sex liberty, uh, which are increasingly viewed as juxtaposed, and we are increasingly forced into a cultural and constitutional brinksmanship game. And Professor Wilson is one of the few leading academics uh, in the world who is spending time trying to map uh, the frontier between uh, these uh, very hard positions that have begun to emerge, and has done that uh, with great courage and great effectiveness. And I'm delighted to have a chance to say that to your colleagues and uh, to have this chance to be with you for 23 and three quarter hours uh, here in Champaign-Urbana. <laughs> As I was pondering my remarks for this afternoon, I drew some inspiration from a story that U.S. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas used to tell about his father. Justice Douglas's father was an itinerant pastor, 
and he served part-time in a number of churches that were too small to afford their own full-time pastors. And one Sunday morning, the Reverend Douglas appeared in a small church to lead the service and deliver the sermon, and he discovered on his arrival there was but one solitary soul in the entire sanctuary, and that was a cowboy visiting from the West. And so before proceeding, the Reverend Douglas came down off the pulpit and asked this young man if he really wanted to have the entire liturgy read and the full sermon delivered. And the young man was very uncomfortable, and he frowned, and he fidgeted, and he scratched his chin a little, and finally said, well, I'm just a cowboy from Montana, and I don't know much, but I do know that if I went out in the middle of winter to feed the herd, and I found only one cow left, I sure would not leave her to starve. Well, that's encouraged. The Reverend Douglas bounded up onto the pulpit. He read through the entire liturgy. He delivered his full sermon, fire and brimstone and all. And after finally completing his efforts, he came down off the pulpit and approached this solitary soul in the sanctuary and said, what'd you think? Well, the young man was, again, very uncomfortable, and he frowned, and he fidgeted, and he scratched his chin a little, and finally said, well, I'm just a cowhand from Montana, and I don't know much. But I do know that if I went out in the middle of winter to feed the herd, and I found only one cow left, I sure would not dump my entire load of feed on just that one cow. <laughs> well, this afternoon I propose to dump the entire load on you. I'd like to spend some time talking about the issue of polygamy, which is in some sense on the frontier of family law, constitutional law, sexual liberty, criminal law, religious freedom, and is one of the areas of discourse that is going to occupy us over the next 10 or 15 years uh, in uh, both cultural and professional settings, and you lawyers are going to confront that when you get out into practice. So we'll spend a little time fussing with this together today. A century and a half ago, American Mormons made international headlines by claiming the religious freedom to practice polygamy despite criminal laws against it. In four cases from 1879 to 1890, the U.S. Supreme Court firmly rejected their claims. Part of the court's argument was historical. The common law has always defined marriage to be monogamous, and to change those rules, said the court, would be a return to barbarism. Part of the court's argument was prudential. Religious liberty can never become a license to violate general criminal laws, lest chaos ensue. And part of the court's argument was sociological. Monogamous marriage, it said, is the cornerstone of Western civilization, and it cannot be moved without upending our whole culture. These millennium-old prohibitions on polygamy are still the law of the land today, not only in all 50 American states, but in 121 of the 198 nations, including all of Europe and Latin America, as well as Russia, China, Japan, and much of India. The question of polygamy is back in the Western headlines. Fundamentalist Mormons and various Muslim, Hmong, and traditional emigres from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East are pressing new arguments to practice polygamy on grounds of religious freedom and cultural self-determination. Various liberal scholars have now joined their cause, pressing arguments of sexual liberty, autonomy, equality. Traditional criminal prohibitions against adultery, abortion, contraception, and sodomy, they argue, have all been struck down. Criminal prohibitions against polygamy must thus be repealed too, the argument goes. Same-sex marriage is now constitutionally protected in several Western nations. Polygamous marriages must now be allowed too. The first cases challenging the constitutionality of anti-polygamy criminal laws have been filed in North America and Europe. The first rounds of public debate about the legality of polygamy have appeared in elite Western newspapers, journals, and social media, with a number of writers favoring polygamy. The first wave of popular media portrayals of good polygamist families is now broken, with shows like Big Love and Sister Wives stoking the cultural imagination and sympathy, much like Ozzie and Harriet and Little House on the Prairie did for old timers like me. Just as same-sex marriage advocates moved first against the criminalization of sodomy and then for the recognition of same-sex marriage, so pro-polygamy advocates aim first to repeal traditional criminal laws against polygamy and then to include polygamy amongst the marriage options that are held out on that rack of marriage options by the state. 
But the, legaliza the legalization of polygamy is neither inevitable nor advisable, I'd like to argue. Despite the legalization of same-sex marriage and the liberalization of many sexual mores and relationships today, traditional Western prohibitions on same-sex relationships and many other traditional sexual crimes were largely biblical in origin, and they have fallen aside as public biblical faith has waned and private constitutional liberties have waxed. But the Western legal tradition's prohibitions on polygamy were both pre-Christian in origin and post-Christian in operation, and now serve to enhance rather than erode constitutional liberties, especially those of women and children. I say pre-Christian because the Bible has no clear prohibition against polygamy and counts more than two dozen polygamists amongst the leaders of the faith. The Mosaic law countenanced polygamy in cases of seduction, enslavement, poverty, famine, or premature death of one's married brother. The New Testament said nothing about polygamy save in requiring that a bishop or deacon must be the husband of one wife and a deaconess the wife of one husband, leaving the laity uninstructed. The church was thus rather slow to ban polygamy, even though it quickly condemned many other sexual practices in the Roman Empire as unbiblical and immoral and grounds for excommunication. Sodomy, transvestism, fornication, adultery, mixed bathing, prostitution, abortion, infanticide, and more. Not a word about polygamy. It was the pagan Greeks of the 5th and the 4th century BCE who first declared polygamy to be a form of, quote, domestic tyranny that disadvantaged unjustly women and children, quote, unquote. And it was the, quote, pagan Roman emperors who first criminalized polygamy in 258 of the Common Era, more than a century before they established Christianity and nearly a millennium before church authorities finally issued comparably firm prohibitions in its internal church law. The high medieval Catholic church and early modern Protestant churches, too, eventually made these anti-polygamous sentiments a part of their theology, morality, and canon law, and they added their own deep arguments that marriage was created, after all, as a two-in-one flesh union of male and female, modeled on God's covenant love with his elect people of Israel and Christ's sacramental love for his church. But Christianity was really a carrier not an inventor of the West's criminal prohibition on polygamy. And its normative stands against polygamy were as much philosophical and prudential an argument as they were theological and biblical. Because of this, the Western tradition's aversion to polygamy eventually became decidedly post-Christian as well. Long after they disestablished Christianity, Western nations in Europe and North America remained firmly opposed to polygamy, indeed retaining it as a capital crime till the middle of the 19th century. And indeed, some of the strongest Western arguments came from Enlightenment liberals, who firmly rejected Christianity and Christian establishments, but also firmly rejected polygamy as a betrayal of reason, nature, utility, fairness, liberty, and common sense. And they marshaled their strongest anti-polygamy arguments, not so much against secular sexual libertines as against avant-garde Christians who were using the Bible to press the case for polygamy as a cure-all for all manner of social, sexual, and psychological ills, both at home and on the mission field. Three main arguments are at the heart of the Western case against polygamy. Arguments from nature, from harm, and from symbolism. Each of them pressed from various premises and perspectives, and each of them quite different from the arguments used to condemn sodomy and same-sex unions. Together, these arguments still support traditional prohibitions on polygamy, even in states that now accept same-sex marriage, sexual liberty, religious freedom, and more. Let's trot through a few of these traditional arguments of nature, harm, and symbolism. The heart of the traditional natural argument against same-sex relations was that gay and lesbian sex is by nature non-generative. 
However consensual and loving, same-sex intimacy cannot produce a child, which the tradition took to be a sine qua non of marital relations. Having a child, classical and Christian authors alike agreed, was essential for the preservation of the human race and for the perpetuation of one's own family name and business, property, identity, memory, and more. Moreover, these traditional writers argued, even the beasts do not engage in same-sex activities, despite their lack of reason and conscience. Many animals do kill and eat each other and take each other's homes and food and mates and offspring, acts which rational humans have declared to be crimes of homicide, theft, adultery, and infanticide. But even the beasts following natural instincts alone know that same-sex activities are unnatural, even repulsive. Rational humans should at least do the same, the argument goes. Now these traditional natural arguments, all of which are deeply contested today, do not at all apply to polygamy. Procreation is not only possible, but is enhanced by having multiple wives rather than one. Polygamy is not only known in nature, but it is the predominant form of reproduction in most animals, including more than 95% of all higher primates. Pairing birds and voles and a few other animals are the monogamous exception. The human body is not only capable of having multiple sex partners, but a man can impregnate several women in a night, though a woman can have only one pregnancy at a time, no matter how many men she takes into her bed that night. That's why St. Augustine and later Western sages such as Hugo Grotius thought that polygyny, one man with several wives, was a natural form of procreation, although polyandry, one wife with several husbands, was not. The traditional natural argument against polygamy was of a rather different order. Nearly eight centuries ago, the Dominican friar Thomas Aquinas put the argument clearly and it became a commonplace of Western thought and law thereafter, especially amongst Enlightenment liberals and common law jurists who took it as an axiomatic statement of natural justice in the home. Human beings, Thomas argued, are distinct, if not unique, among the animals in having perennial sex drives rather than short annual mating seasons, especially when they're young, and fertile, like many of you. Humans, secondly, produce babies who are utterly fragile and dependent, who cannot just get up and run and fly and swim away, but for a long time need the support of both their mother and their father and the kin networks that they represent. Women, thirdly, bond naturally, empathetically with children, Men do so only if they are certain of their paternity. Put a baby on a walk, and every woman will stop by out of natural empathy, said Aquinas. Most men will walk by unless they're looking for their kid. Exclusive and enduring unions are the only way that humans can at once have regular sex, paternal certainty, and mutual caretaking for their young, fragile, dependent children. Humans have thus learned, said Aquinas, by natural inclination and hard experience to the contrary, to develop enduring pair bonding strategies as the most effective means of reproduction. Later Catholic and Protestant writers argue that polygamy violates not only natural law or justice of reproduction, but also the natural rights of wives and children. Taking the Ten Commandments as the best summary of the natural law, 16th century Calvinist Theodore Beza argued that polygamy violates the commands against adultery, theft, false promises, and coveting all at once. Each of these natural duties has a correlative natural right that polygamy also breaches, said Beza. Polygamy breaches the first wife's natural rights to marital fidelity and trust, to ongoing marital property and material security, and to contractual expectations and reliance, his words, on her husband's fidelity to the marriage contract. 
It breaches the children's natural rights to proper support and inheritance and to the undiluted and unharried care, nurture, and education of their father and mother together. And polygamy breaches a neighbor's rights to have an equal opportunity to marry without having most of the eligible women hoarded in one harem or having his own wife or daughters subject to the covetous privations of a powerful polygamous neighbor. Polygamy was thus doubly unnatural, Beza concluded, a violation of natural law and natural rights alike. Enlightenment liberals and common law jurists from the 17th century onward drew directly on these traditional arguments against polygamy, even if they rejected the Christianity that undergirded them. Most liberals posited natural rights as inherent in human nature or the state of nature rather than commanded in the Bible or the order of creation, but they came to the same conclusion that polygamy violated the natural rights of women and children. John Locke, for example, regarded polygamy as a violation of the natural born equality of men and women, as well as the natural rights of children to be properly nurtured and fully supported by both their mother and father until they were fully emancipated. A century later, leading common law jurist William Blackstone condemned poly polygamy as a singularly barbaric violation of the reciprocal natural rights and duties of husbands and wives and parents and children, which no modern civilization could countenance. Polygamy for him was a grave offense against public health, safety, welfare, and order. Scottish philosophers Henry Holm and Adam Smith and David Hume argued that polygamy would breed either, depending on the child's status, tyrannical patriarchy or servile submissiveness in children at the cost of their natural liberty or that of their neighbors. Children of polygamy whose mothers are deprecated, whose stepmothers are hostile, and whose fathers are distant and distracted simply cannot learn the healthy balances of natural authority and liberty, equality and respect that they need to survive, let alone thrive as democratic citizens, said these Scottish philosophers. That's enough about these nature arguments. We could talk about more during Q&A. The Western tradition treated polygamy not only as a violation of nature, but as a cause, consequence, and or corollary of harm. Some 1800 years ago, ancient Jewish rabbis and early church fathers alike warned that polygamy was literally trouble, which is the literal meaning of the Hebrew term for a second wife, Zara. It was trouble even when practiced by the most noble and God-fearing men and women of the Bible. Abraham with Sarah and Hagar, Jacob with Rachel and Leah, Elkanah with Hannah and Penina, all of these biblical polygamists faced bitter rivalry between their wives, bitter disputes amongst their children over inheritance, deadly competition amongst half-siblings that escalated to incest, adultery, kidnapping, enslavement, banishment, and more. Think of the great King David, who lustfully murdered Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, to add her to his already ample harem. Or think of King Solomon, the wise man with his 1,000 wives and concubines, who led him into idolatry and whose half-children ended up raping, abducting, and killing each other, precipitating civil war in ancient Israel. Some 800 years ago, Bishop William of Avange and other Christian observers of Middle Eastern Muslim polygamy whom they encountered on the frontier and during the Crusades argued that the, quote, bent love of polygamy was inevitably, if not inherently, harmful. Women of polygamy are harmed, William argued, because they are reduced to rival slaves within the household. They're exploited for sex with an increasingly sterile, distracted, if not flaccid husband, sometimes deprived of the children they do produce and forced to make do for themselves and their children with too few resources as other women and other children are added to the household against their wishes. Children are harmed too, said William, because their chances of birth and survival, especially if they're little runts or girls or unwanted, are diminished by their calculating fathers, 
who might contracept, abort, smother, or sell them, and by their mothers who sometimes lack the resources, support, and protection to bring them to term, let alone to adulthood. Men are harmed too, said William, because they do not have the time, energy, or resources to support their polygamous households, and because their minds and hearts cannot rest if they are always on the lookout for another woman to add to their harems, think King David and Bathsheba. And societies are harmed, said Williams, because polygamy results in marriage of the richest and the most powerful, rather than the most virtuous, the fittest man in the community. Societies are harmed too because now there are too many unattached men who still have those sex drives and who become menaces to public order and sexual morality through hmm, seduction, prostitution, and un other untoward behavior. And society is harmed because polygamy creates too many ad hoc seats of domestic power, which are based on sheer numbers rather than on legitimate political succession or election. Some 500 years ago, European critics of the town of Münster, Germany, documented the incredible harms done when Anabaptist leaders gained power to establish an isolated polygamous community right in the heartland of Christendom, 7,500 or so strong. There in Münster, a group of young men, giddy with lust and theocratic pretensions, Combine charisma, brutality, and biblical platitudes and exemplars to force a gullible Christian community to adopt their utopian vision of biblical polygamy. Young women were coerced into premature and unwanted marriages with older men. Even little prepubescent girls were fair game, and 18 of them were literally raped to death. Husbands collected wives like spiritual trophies, measuring their faith by the size of their harems and their nurseries. Wives were used and then spurned when they were pregnant or nursing or when the next attractive wife was added to the harem. Polygamous households were filled with bickering wives and children and were then cowed into silence with threats of the sword. Women who still objected or who rejected their husband's sexual advances to protest the unwanted polygamy, were summarily executed, 187 of them, we know, in three years. Community dissenters and critics of these utopian excesses were summarily banished or executed as well. 150 years ago, American critics of polygamy pointed to some of these same things, usually at a lower scale and added further the argument that a, Muslim, a Mormon theocracy based on polygamy violates the constitutional command for separation of church and state. Today, observers of polygamous communions scattered about the West, sometimes in sensational cases like the yearning for Zion Ranch case we heard a few years ago, but also in more humdrum day-to-day -day cases, point to similar problems of much higher than average incidences of arranged, coerced, and underage marriage of young girls to older men, of rape and statutory rape, of wife and child abuse, of social and educational deprivation of women, children, in polygamous households, of abuse and ostracism of young boys and poor men who compete for fewer brides, of rampant social welfare abuses by oversized polygamous families, by social isolation of polygamous communities and dangerous conflations of religious and political authority. Outside of the West, most polygamous cultures are rural, rural poor, and uneducated, with low technology and labor-intensive economies that require many children to do the work and that feature very low survival rates amongst these children. Or they are part of powerful political and religious families in traditional tribal settings, Muslim settings, or both. But regardless of whether it is practiced in a Western democracy or sub-Saharan Africa, polygamy produces harmful effects that ripple through a society. Brown University political scientist Rose McDermott has concluded after an exhaustive 170-nation survey of the practice of polygamy on the ground today. 
all of these polygamous communities suffer from increased levels of physical and sexual abuse against women, increased rates of maternal mortality, shortened female life expectancy, lower educational levels for girls, lower levels of equality for women, increased rates of female genital mutilation to preclude sexual wandering, increased rates of trafficking in women, and decreased levels of civil, and liberty, civil liberties and rights for all citizens. Western law has thus long regarded polygamy as a malum in se offense, something evil in itself. Other malum in se offenses today include slavery and sex trafficking, prostitution, indentured servitude, obscenity, bestiality, incest, sex with children, organ selling, cannibalism, and a few more. Polygamy is usually regarded as less egregious than some other offenses on this list. But like other malum in se offenses, polygamy is too often the cause, consequence, or corollary of other harmful wrongdoing. That someone wants to engage in these activities voluntarily for reasons of religion, bravery, custom, or autonomy makes no difference. That other cultures, past and present, allow such activities also makes no difference. For nearly two millennia, the Western legal tradition has included polygamy among the crimes that are inherently wrong, because polygamy routinizes patriarchy, deprecates women, jeopardizes consent, fractures fidelity, divides loyalty, dilutes devotion, fosters inequity, promotes rivalry, foments lust, condones adultery, harms children, and more. Not in every case, to be sure, but in enough cases to make the practice of polygamy too risky to condone as a viable legal option held out by the state. Furthermore, allowing religious polygamy as an exception to the rules is even more dangerous, the Western tradition has concluded, because it will make some churches, mosques, tribes, and temples a law unto themselves. It is notable that no religious community in the West today regards polygamy as an absolute requirement. Polygamy is a custom, not a command, an option, not an obligation for the faithful. It is also notable that some Western communities that once preached and practiced polygamy, namely Jews and most Mormons and a number of Muslims too, have now rejected the practice, suggested that holding the line will eventually force internal religious change. But even if polygamy were relig religiously obligatory, modern Western constitutional laws still empower states to prohibit behavior that the states consider harmful or dangerous. But these traditional criminal laws against polygamy are more than just prudential prophylactics against harm and crime. They also play an important symbolic or teaching function. And with this, we come to our third and final little cluster of arguments. Historically in the West, the laws against polygamy were part of a broader set of family laws designed to support the classic Western ideal that the monogamous family was the most primal and essential institution of Western society and culture. Aristotle and the Roman Stoics called the union of husband and wife and parent and child the foundation of the polis, the private font of public virtue. The church fathers and medieval Catholics called the monogamous household the seedbed of the city, the force that welds society together. Early modern Protestants and Anglo-American common lawyers alike called the stable household a little church, a little seminary, a little commonwealth the first school of love and justice, nurture and education, charity and citizenship. John Locke and the Enlightenment philosophers called marriage the first contract to be formed as men and women came forth from the state of nature and the deepest font of liberty, equality and fraternity in an orderly republic. All these traditional metaphors aimed to celebrate and to teach and model a certain vision of the good life and the good society with monogamous marriage at its core. For all of our new cultural emphasis on liberty and autonomy and for all of our current wariness about totalitarian state power, we still look to the state and its law 
to promote health, safety, and welfare, and to discourage activities and relationships that harm or jeopardize them. The state has shrunk the traditional ideals of sex, marriage, and family life that it teaches, and modern family law systems have moved away from many of the absolute thou shalt and thou shalt not commands of the past, as well as the harsh measures used to enforce them. But still, in the soft law between these two apodictic poles, the modern state still does its teaching work, nudging its citizens in one direction or another. The state does not require its citizens to get married, but it does nudge in that direction. It provides state marital licenses, tax and social security benefits, spousal health and evidentiary privileges, and hundreds of additional federal and state benefits and incentives. In turn, while the state rarely prosecutes polygamy per se today, it still nudges strongly against polygamy by providing it with no funding, facilitation, licenses, or support, and threatening prosecution when polygamy is harm, com combined with other harms and crimes. All Western nations to date have held the line against polygamy, even if they have accepted same-sex marriage and rejected many other traditional sex crimes in favor of sexual liberty and autonomy and privacy. They should, in my view, continue to do so. Polygamy not only causes or correlates with too many harms to women, children, men, and society alike, it not only defies the monogamous family form that the Western classical Christian and liberal traditions have defended for 2,500 years and have now extended to same-sex parties too. It not only ignores the conclusion of modern evolutionists from Claude Levi Strauss to Bernard Chappé that pair bonding is the, quote, deep structure of human reproduction that humans have developed, evolved as their best strategy for long-term survival and success. But let's face it, the argument for polygamy is, and always has been, primarily about a small group of men seeking the social, moral, and legal imprimatur to have and to hold sundry females at once. But there's plenty of empirical evidence to show that historically and today, most men and almost all women are instinctively attracted to single partner intimacy for the long term, especially when children are involved and instinctively repulsed and angered if forced to share their bed for the long, a long term with a third party. Despite our wide cultural acceptance of sexual liberty in the West, sexual infidelity still breaks marriage and intimate relationships much more than any other single cause. For the West to maintain its traditional stance against polygamy does not mean that it needs to trade in all the ugly rhetoric that has historically attended this stance. We don't have to posit narratives of progress that brand polygamists as barbarians and savages lacking in virtue or value as earlier jurists and social scientists and philosophers often did. We don't have to say that the West is more advanced or progressive than the rest because of its monogamy. We don't have to repeat all the haughty and xenophobic, xenophobic arguments against polygamists. The West can now simply and politely say to the polygamist who bangs on his door, seeking admission or permission to practice polygamy, no thank you, we don't do that here, and close the door firmly. Thank you very much. Apparently, I may be reading more Reddit than uh, Professor Witte, because I, I am seeing a lot of things out in the sort of space where we uh, have folks who are, in fact, engaging in plural relationships. Whether they're doing that um, within the bounds of marriage is another question. So, And if you are encountering those stories, I'd feel grateful to you if you would shoot those my way by email so that we can talk about those in our next family law class. But the bit of business that I wanted to do before we take your questions is um, I'm deeply privileged to uh, be able to present uh, John Whitty Jr., uh, the 2016 
Lifetime Achievement Award in Family Law. He joined our family law class this morning for breakfast. Uh, and in the course of that, you know, um, very humbly said, you know, really, I'm not a family law scholar. But you heard well that this man knows the history and the tradition around the family as well as anyone. He has published his 30th book this year. There are many legal academics that don't have 30 articles, <laughs> yet alone 30 books. And they include not only the one that he just gave you, a preface for the Western case for monogamy over polygamy, but they also include Sex, Marriage, and Family, and John Calvin's Geneva, The Sins of the Father, The Law and Theology of Illegitimacy Reconsidered, something that resonated very much with Harry Krauss, who was one of our very own and an inaugural uh, winner of the same award. Um, and, and then he's equally impressive uh, on questions of marriage and his um, one of his foundational books, From Sacrament to Contract, Marriage, Religion, and Law in the Western Tradition. So it is a great privilege to me to be able to present John Witte with the Lifetime Achievement Award in Family Law. And that's an wow, thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> And so it's your time. Who wants to start us off? I've seen you sort of itching, Daniel. Well, before your time, I want to just say a, a brief word of thanks and appreciation and admiration uh, for uh, Harry Krauss, uh, for whom this award is named. He is one of the great giants of family law scholarship in the 20th century. He's one of the cornerstones of this institution at the University of Illinois College of Law. He was one of the great, great men in the law courageous in his vision, uh, able to uh, transcend the particulars of his field and to work uh, both in the academy and in the bench and the bar uh, to engage the hard questions of intimate relations, of domestic relations, especially at a time of remarkable tumult uh, during the sexual and divorce revolution. Uh, he was courageous in his advocacy on behalf of children and children's rights, and it's a great, great honor to stand on the shoulders of a giant and to get a little higher uh, view of the world. And so I want to thank um, uh, Professor Wilson and her colleagues for the kindness in recognizing me. Um, I hope this is woefully premature. <laughs> a, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award is for a 50-year-old something. Um, seems a little uh, either grimly prophetic uh, or premature. I just promised my wife that I would only work for 40 more years and then start slowing down, and, and she accepted that grudgingly. Uh, so I hope I can um, come back and give this to somebody else uh, more deserving in due course. But thank you so much again for your kindness and for the opportunity to engage you in these questions. I kept my lecture rather brief. The book is 543 pages. It is on Amazon.com. I recommend it very, very highly as a doorstop and a little bit of fodder for your fireplace this fall or winter. Um, but it's a, a long historical story that has a little normative kicker at the end, and I just gave you a bit of the normative kicker. I hope I've babbled long enough to give you a chance to formulate a question or two. Uh, the floor is open for anybody. Fire away. <laughs> 